so uh, Chaz Emmerich, for those of you who don't know him, is uh, infamous in the closure community for just being a really mean guy. I mean, you, you do not want to mess with uh, the, the guy standing next to me, which is why uh, he has now twice organized fundraisers to bring people to ClosureCon who couldn't otherwise do so. <laughs> Last year, uh, he brought uh, Anthony Grimes uh, to the Conj for the first time, and uh, if you saw Anthony's talk yesterday, I think you can agree that was a runaway success. Uh, and this year, he managed to top even that by bringing Ambrose from halfway around the world to come to Closure Con. So, I, I don't know what's next, the moon? Or <laughs> anyway, here he is talking about Bayesian Networks. So, uh, just to, how's the sound? Just to clarify, uh, I fundamentally didn't do anything except heard people around. I want to thank everybody who's ever donated or helped uh, uh, Anthony or Ambrose uh, in any way possible. And everybody uh, that I've ever known in the closure community has been fantastic. And I certainly wouldn't be doing many things that I'm doing now without all of you guys. So uh, I appreciate everything. So uh, talking a little bit about uh, Bayesian networks. Um, who I am. I, uh, I'm Chaz Emmerich. Uh, I've been using Clojure for a long time, uh, or a long time in the, uh, in the uh, uh, continuum of when Clojure's been around. Uh, I've been a contributor here and there, and I do way too many other, stu uh, too many other things, including uh, putting the final touches on a Clojure book for O'Reilly. Uh, so we're breaking the O'Reilly Lisp curse, uh, finally. Um, <laughs> And talking to you a little bit about Bayesian networks. Uh, first, a little bit about why Bayesian networks. Uh, many, some of you may be taking the online courses uh, for machine learning or artificial intelligence. Uh, and whether you have or not, you've probably heard all sorts of different tools and techniques and methodologies for handling uh, uh, various problems that aren't amenable to straightforward implementations and Bayesian networks are one. I chose to focus on them because uh, of a couple of reasons that we can get into in a little bit of detail is that there's a lot of modeling options. Uh, so certainly when I was in college, I did a lot of work with neural networks and other black boxes like that. Um, and the problem with them is that if you get a result that you are unhappy with uh, or you would like to get an explanation of a result, Generally, that's not possible. You open up a neural network and it's just a bunch of weights and you have no idea where those came from and you have no other recourse but to go retrain over an updated, refreshed data set. Um, and, and, and going back to the, to the uh, uh, modeling point, those networks are built automatically. There's no uh, connection between like internal neural network nodes and things that have real semantic value to you out in your world. Uh, and so Bayesian networks help uh, resolve that. Um, on, the, on the point about them not being black boxes, you can actually do root cause analysis uh, and determine, you know, how did you arrive at this answer? What part of my data set contributed to providing this answer? Uh, and that can be very helpful in debugging scenarios as well as uh, just modeling in general. And because of their granularity, they can interact with other systems at, at any level. You don't have to go whole hog and choose to build your entire application on Bayesian networks. You can integrate things like logic programming into them at different levels. And also, they're optimizable. So uh, although I haven't touched this particular corner of it, uh, you can compile Bayesian networks down to circuits, essentially. And at some point, I'd like to actually emit closure code that you then load, and then you're not uh, paying the penalty for having that that Bayesian network reified up into a model that you have to interpret, essentially. So a couple of disclaimers. I'm a practitioner, which is, uh, which is a short way of saying that I have no idea what I'm talking about fundamentally. Um, I am a software developer with various problems that I have to solve, and most of them I try to do very straightforwardly, and I keep on bumping into things that need different treatments, thus Bayesian networks. And so 
that's all as a, as a long way of saying that I've needed to just uh, bootstrap my way from nothing, not having had a lot of formal training in mathematics or statistics or anything. And so I have to give a little bit of credit to some materials that I would not have been able to do anything in this domain without, in, in particular, the uh, blue book, Darwish, uh, Modeling and Reasoning of Bayesian Networks. Uh, from, some, from my perspective, where I'm coming from a place where I don't know the formalisms that well, uh, it's a very easy ramp compared to some of the other literature. And of course, the uh, uh, two books from Judea Pearl that really go into the, into the uh, epistemological bases for uh, why Bayesian networks have the, effic the efficacy that they do and the nice uh, uh, correspondence that they have with how we reason about the world and how we can uh, help our programs reason about the world effect effectively. So. You hear about machine, le uh, machine learning, you hear about artificial intelligence, and it all sounds a little um, disconnected from reality, uh, especially when you look at sample problem sets and things like that. Uh, and so I just wanted to touch on a couple of uh, domains that are applicable. So anytime you're working with incomplete representations of the world, you have crummy data, you have noisy data, you have unreliable data, you have data that you cannot depend upon, uh, you need to have some mechanism to help cope with that and uh, get you out the other side with decisions to the questions uh, uh, that you ask of it. And examples of these include industrial process control with various sensor systems, decision systems of, of all kinds in terms of modeling business relationships and business processes, uh, prediction of all sorts, and also classification of all sorts. One of the most uh, uh, well-known examples of the use of Bayesian inference is in uh, email classification for spam filtering. Uh, Paul Graham is probably the most uh, well-known instance of someone talking about that topic. Uh, so there's a lot of very, very practical domains. Just to really bring it down to brass tacks, uh, what I do is a lot of document analysis. Um, so this is a uh, SEC filing um, that there's nothing particularly special about it. It's a bunch of uh, financial holdings and shares and uh, current value and for the uh, fixed income stuff, they got principal amount and all that. Uh, nothing special. If all the documents I had to work with looked like this, then I wouldn't be talking about Bayesian networks. I'd be having a beer right now. Um, unfortunately, this same data that has a structure, this data came out of a database somewhere, and the only way you can get access to it and access to a lot of data like it is by pulling it out of documents like this that have no structure to them, and what people end up doing is they have farms of people man manually keying in data like this because it comes in forms like that and like that, same data, same fundamental structure underlying it and like that. Uh, it's particularly nice when instead of having graphical tables, they use ASCII dashes and pipes and things like that. To, that's, that's good. So, <laughs> so, so, uh, what I've been, uh, what I do, especially in the past couple of years, is working on ways to systematically extract structured data out of documents like this, where you have a particular document type, where it, especially a domain expert can characterize the structure of that data, and what you'd like to have is something, you could call it an, ex an extraction plan, that takes a corpus of these documents and produces a CSV file or an XML file. Uh, so that's what I use this for. Uh, you might be able to uh, find some applicability in your domain. But what I think we'll talk about for right now is a simple example just so that people can understand how things, where the, where the moving parts are. Um, so you have a bunch of variable states in your world or your data set. And this is a canonical example pulled from uh, Judea Pearl's uh, original materials. Whether uh, the ground is wet, whether it's raining, what season is it, and whether the sprinkler on your lawn is running. Uh, and there are some dependencies between these states out in the world, uh, and you can imagine collecting data about those states and wanting to reason about uh, if you know some subset of, uh, that, of those states at a partic particular point in time, you might want to ask questions about what's the likely state of uh, uh, those variables that I don't have information for. 
so feature selection is a very deep and complicated field in and of itself. It's very domain specific. Uh, the, the features that I use when doing document analysis are going to be different than when you uh, extract features when trying to do handwriting recognition, when you're trying to do email spam classification, or whatever else you're, you're, you're applying these techniques to. Uh, and to bring it down to a more concrete level, these random variables you can sort of think of as closure identities. So if you think of out in the world, there's an atom for each one of these that has a particular value in it at a point in time, and you can take observations of them, and they change over time. So the next time you go and look, you see, oh, it's spring now. I wonder what the likelihood is that my lawn is wet. So I had a hard time understanding Bayesian inference for a while. Not that I claim to understand it still. Um, but one thing that helped me was thinking about uh, these random variables in terms of a truth table. And so you can take, uh, I've, I've elided out season and just using spring so that we're always working with uh, random variables that are discrete and Boolean, so that simplifies things to a certain degree. Uh, you can have an enumeration of all possible states of your world. If this is your entire world, there's going to be 16 different potential states of that world of all different permutations of those random variables. Uh, and then you can describe what the different re relations are between them using various logical relations and things. Uh, again, if this was enough to solve my problems, I would have stopped there and used regular programming. But sometimes logic isn't enough. Um, <laughs> That's me most days, anyway. Uh, so I, I talked about truth tables because they, they look to me and feel to me uh, similar to, in concept anyway, joint probability distributions. That's a hell of a thing to try and take in. But wh what this is really talking about is we still, have, we still have, in this case, because we have four variables that are all Boolean, we have 16 different worlds that are possible. And each of those random variables has a probability associated with it based upon our prior observations of them. Those are called your prior probabilities. And each world has a particular joint probability, which is notated on the right. And so for any particular combination or, or, or pre permutation of states for these random variables, you have, you have a known prior probability of that world being true. And so if you know that, uh, if you know that, it's, if, that the sprinkler is running, then you can eliminate a large number of potential worlds. And that changes the posterior probability of the other worlds when you are performing classification or inference and so on. Um, right, so the nice thing about this is that given x and y, any random variables, a model like this allows you to say, uh, how likely is Z, but also given A or B, you can ask it what additional data would most, would most likely help me understand the likely state of C. So there's a, there's a concept of uh, uh, conditional dependencies. So if you have two variables that are independent and you're trying to find out the state of a third, finding the independent variable state isn't going to help you find the state of the third at all. You want to find one that uh, has a conditional dependency on that third one. Uh, right. So we need to learn about, about probability for a little while. It's only going to take about 10 minutes. This is your reaction, panic uh, and sorrow. Um, but I'm kidding. I'm not actually going to do that. Uh, I'm, I'm not uh, any kind of authority on Bayesian statistics, uh, and there are much better uh, sources for that information. But just to take a look at uh, sort of the punchline of Bayesian uh, inference uh, placed within the context of the model we're looking at, if we want to know the probability that our lawn is wet and we know from observation that it is spring, to determine that, we find from our prior probabilities, from our prior observations, what was the probability that it, is, it was spring when we saw that the lawn was wet. 
and then we factor that back using the uh, uh, singular probabilities for whether the lawn was wet and divide that all by the, by the uh, probability that it was spring. And that brings the scales, especially if you're using continuous variables, back up to what you had dropped into your model to begin with. That's all I'm going to say about details. So joint probability distributions don't scale. Uh, you notice for four random variables, we had 16 worlds. Uh, this is a problem because the joint probability distribution, the size of that table is the, uh, the number of potential states in your random variables uh, to the power of however many you have. That's bad. So we have 16 worlds in our uh, example model and you know, 20 random variables. That's a pretty small world uh, and you get into some serious trouble. If you have three discrete states, that's 3.486 times 10 to the ninth. It's bad. So you can't use joint probability distributions. That's the, that's the model you want to have in your head for conceptualizing the uh, problem uh, uh, at a higher level, but we need a better representation of that uh, joint probability. So going back to our features, those look suspiciously like nodes, and uh, when you connect them uh, using some method, using edges in this case to indicate causality, so if you are relatively aware of how seasons and uh, weather patterns and the effects of sprinklers on lawns, uh, you can develop a model that indicates that uh, the probability of it raining or the sprinkler being on is dependent upon which season it is and the probability that your lawn is wet is dependent upon the probability of it raining and or your sprinkler being on. Um, and so this is, a, this is an example of a manually curated model. Uh, you can find this same model through various search mechanisms if you have a bunch of observations that indicate the coincidence or not of these uh, random variables. Uh, and the arrows can mean causality, uh, and in certain uh, subtle ways, them indicating causality can uh, allow you to uh, guarantee certain semantics about uh, the network and uh, certain performance characteristics about uh, inference. So the effect of this on our runtimes is that instead of joint probability distributions where everything is in a massive table uh, that we can't possibly work with, each level in the uh, Bayesian network only needs to have what are called uh, conditional probability tables, the subset of the joint probability distribution that is relevant at the local level. So the season, uh, that should be, uh, that should be 0 0.025 and 0 0.075. Uh, that's my bad. But each, each level in the network has its own conditional probability table that, is on, that only needs to represent the probability of that node given its parent probability. And so at each level you have much more manageable sizes of uh, conditional probability tables down to this fully populated one here where uh, the, uh, the uh, wet node only needs to have three random variables represented. And uh, this allows us to do the same work as having a full joint probability table, uh, joint probability distribution uh, available to us in uh, log storage. You know, I don't know the details of that, but it's log, it's good. Uh, I, I'm not gonna, <laughs> I'm not gonna try and prove it, it's, it, it works. Um, so, you can exhale now because you've, you've passed through the valley of the shadow of probability and you're probably asking where the hell is the closure. <laughs> so, Raposo is a closure library for Bayesian inference and modeling that I've been working on uh, off and on for probably about six months or so. Uh, it's a re-implementation slash extraction from an existing application that's currently doing that document analysis stuff that I was talking about. I had originally hoped to implement it on its own, off to the side, so I could slice it off and open source it and hopefully get help with things like that, but bad things happen and it's all locked up. So now I'm re-implementing re it from scratch, uh, supporting both continuous and discrete random variables. Um, 
a big difference uh, with Raposo versus uh, any other Bayesian network, uh, Bayesian inference toolkits in Java, of which there are a couple uh, very large and well-respected ones, is that Raposo provides a closure idiomatic treatment of data. Um, all the other frameworks that I looked at, uh, as reliable and sophisticated as they were, they were clearly built by statisticians, not programmers. Uh, and so, for example, you had to load your data into their own concrete data classes and things like that. And if you have any large amount of data and want to have good performance, that's not going to work. Uh, and also, even if I end up using one of those frameworks down the road, I want it to be able to know what's going on under the covers. And so I've been using it as a learning vehicle. Here's, a, here's an example of some closure data that Raposo can consume. Uh, in the first example, they are all uh, discrete Boolean values uh, in a sequence. Each, each set indicates presence of that condition. So in the, in the first uh, set, you have uh, it was raining and the ground was wet. In the second, it was raining and in this particular model, you don't know whether the uh, ground was wet or we just didn't have our wet ground sensor working that day. Um, and then for continuous uh, uh, variables, you can provide maps of identified random variables and either discrete values uh, or uh, uh, continuous values. Now, I have, uh, having been a Java programmer for years and years and years before coming to Clojure and a Scala programmer for a little period in between, I have a, uh, a body of legacy Java code that I've been dragging, kicking and screaming for that long period of time. Uh, and so I need to be able to bring that data into Reposo. And so it defines a protocol called Observed uh, that uh, has two functions, uh, features, which uh, it just provides a sequence of the uh, uh, random variables that that uh, piece of observed data uh, provides and then uh, value which allows you to access it and so uh, the sets and maps within Clojure end up just being a special case of these that there's a default imp implementation of so if you have sets and maps you load them straight in but if you have other uh, if you have other data uh, that is coming from external sources or other libraries uh, you can provide a mapping so that uh, we can get to that data from Raposo, but even beyond that, your implementation of value here could perform uh, uh, some kind of discretization, perhaps, or other feature identification on the fly. When we want to model the world, uh, we have this create model function, uh, and we provide to it a representation of a graph data structure. Again, think back to that, those four nodes with the edges that connect them, uh, that's, that's represented pretty trivial, trivially uh, using a map and uh, uh, sets keyed by their identifiers. Uh, and from this model that we've defined, the, uh, that, that we've defined we can load data into it. Uh, the model that's returned by create model is uh, a closure collection. It's not a vector. It's not a list, it just implements uh, uh, Clojure's uh, iPersistent collection interface. So you can conj data into it, you can use into and all the usual things. And in the background, it will uh, uh, either at the, uh, at each step, it will update the prior probability so that you could, for example, hold a model in, again, an atom and have data streaming in, updating it. And then if you want to perform inferences, you just grab a snapshot of the model, do your work and let it drop on the floor. If you don't have a hand curated model or if you have data for which you, there's no way for you to develop one, uh, then uh, currently Raposo uses Monte Carlo to uh, discover the, uh, the structure of the random variables that you provide within your data set. Um, this is a bit of a hack at the moment. Um, I'm not a huge, uh, I'm not great at the, uh, Monte Carlo at the moment. It's not been my focus. It works for me, but uh, Patch is welcome when it, when it uh, hits GitHub and you can help me improve that part of things. So what does it look like to query this thing? How do we do real work? We've built a model. We've uh, loaded in our data. Let's see what it can do. 
we can ask it, what's the probability that the ground is wet given that we've observed that it's raining uh, by that much. There's no units uh, associated with this at the moment, unfortunately, and that our sprinkler is on to some extent. And we see that we have a 84% chance that it's wet. Uh, these, these particular probabilities are just based off of a dummied up set of data that was vaguely, uh, 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 vaguely likely that I loaded in. Um, again, what's the probability that the ground is wet given that the sprinkler is not on? We can't really say. It's saying 50-50 based on the model that we provided that the, uh, the wetness of the ground is uh, a result of it raining or the sprinkler being on. Right now it doesn't know the state of the, uh, the uh, state of the rain, so it's not providing any information. If we knew that it was springtime or not, then it would provide a better answer one way or the other. Uh, and then conversely, what's the likelihood that it is raining given that the sprinkler is not on and the ground is wet? We have a very high probability of seeing that it's raining. Uh, so the current state of Reposo is that it's working. It's working with test data. It's not, Reposo itself isn't in production. It's that piece that I'm using as a model to re-implement from that's in production. I need to get this thing out on GitHub. Uh, that's happening fairly imminently uh, after the conj. Uh, and I need to, again, get the, uh, get the mechanisms for uh, uh, network learning and generation, currently Monte Carlo exposed with hooks and its own protocols and things like that so people can implement their own and replace the bad one that I have. Uh, I'd really like to pursue optimization of it. Uh, you can, there are very well researched uh, ways of compiling down a Bayesian network to a circuit, as I said, uh, and like to get that uh, pushed out into just closure code that uh, is, is more analogous to a compilation than an, than an interpretation. Uh, also, right now if you just load data instead of providing a hand curated model, it retains all of the random variables it finds within your data but if none of them are coincident, if there are random variables that are entirely independent of anything that you'd like to uh, perform inference or classification over, they still hang around, we still do calculations over them, so we need to do elision of those so that we don't pay that price. And uh, I already talked about compilation. Um, because it has a, because the structure of the network is open, these things are random variables. They're the, the, the random variables and the values that get put in them are black boxes. Uh, the source of that data can be anything. It could be a sensor outside, it could be data from a document, or it could be the result of a, uh, a deterministic result from core logic, for example. So in particular, in, in, in my use cases where I know or my customers know that these particular conditions hold for a type of document, uh, being able to specify that and not uh, pay the price of running this type of uh, Bayesian inference and instead use a logic program to use as an input into the inference uh, would be quite the, uh, quite the optimization. Thank you. <laughs>